Welcome to How the Song Came to Be, where soulful songwriters share the stories behind their songs, as well as tools and creative practices you can use to bring your best songs or other creative works to life. I'm Ann Heaton, your host. But the, some of the big things that I've found, there's a whole myth around madness and creativity. And I really try to shatter that myth whenever I yeah. talk about this because I don't think it's true. I don't think we have to suffer to be good artists. Welcome songwriters. I'm Ann Heaton, your host and founder of Soul Song School. I'm here with Meg Hutchinson. I'm so excited. Meg Hutchinson is a nationally touring singer-songwriter as well as an advocate for mental health and practicing Buddhist. She's released eight albums and received recognition from song contests such as Billboard, John Lennon, Caraville Folk Festival, Telluride Folk Festival, and the Rocky Mountain Folk Fest. Her music has been called as powerful as it is gentle, which feels so true as a fan of her music. Um, in 2015, I believe it was, she released a film called Pack Up Your Sorrows, which addresses wellness and navigating a mental health journey. Um, she can be seen playing shows in Boston where she's studying to be a chaplain. And if you want to hear more of Meg's music, you can do that on iTunes or at meghutchinson.com. Meg, welcome to the show. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. So Meg and I chat a lot, and I thought, privately, and I thought it would be really fun to have one of our conversations uh, a little more publicly about creativity and songwriting, because um, I know she has a, a lot to offer um, in terms of getting the work done, because I've been watching her do that for many years. Um, but first, I would love to ask you a question I'm asking all of the songwriters which I don't know the answer to, and how did you get into, how and why did you get into songwriting? That's a really good question, and it feels so far back. I wonder if I can even remember, but I, when I was about nine or ten, um, my grandmother's Martin guitar arrived from California. My grandmother had passed away, and I'd been taking guitar lessons for like a year. I knew probably three chords, and but they just kind of decided that the guitar should go to me and it felt so important i mean it just to i barely knew my grandmother and to have this guitar just arrive at my house felt so important and wow so i think from a really early age like there was i was very drawn to music and um, my main lesson teacher at the waldorf school was the music teacher for the whole school so we sang all day long um, but when it really started to uh, become central in my life was my early teens. And a lot of things were getting very, very challenging in my life. My parents split up. I was at a new school. And my inner life started to feel um, it, very private. But, but music was the only way I could actually access my feelings. And what I noticed in, in my teens was that it wasn't conscious yet. A lot of what I was dealing with, um, especially later when it was depression that I was hiding from the world, music was the one way I could be honest. It was the one way I could access my deeper life, even before it was conscious. Like I listened to early songs and I go, oh my gosh, this kid is struggling with depression. Wow. Help her. But at the time I was saying, I don't know where these songs are coming from. And I wasn't able to make that link. I was so private. Uh, but songs were the honest place. And I think that was the huge compelling thing for me as I became more of a songwriter in my late teens. It was that that was the channel where I could fully be myself and say publicly what was going on. And eventually it took many, many years, but eventually I was able to own the songs and say that is come, that is really me. But for a long time, I was just like, it's the muse or this song is about someone else. Or, you know, I couldn't really, uh, make the connection, but but it was you know it was medicine from the beginning. I think. Yeah, I was going to ask you what did that make a big difference in how you were feeling at the time? 
It did. Is that like a coping strategy? Absolutely. And I think, you know, even when you look at the science of it, I've been reading a lot about um, mm. the vagus nerve and how much singing activates the vagus nerve. And actually, from a very, like, neurological level, it resets the body and grounds you and it does something just to use your voice. So I think there were many ways that it was actually very self-soothing and very regulating long before I realized I needed more help than that to deal yeah. with my brain chemistry. Music was the way that just made me feel better. Wow. So, so great that you found it and such a miracle that your grandmother's guitar was sent to you. That's amazing. And I want to fast forward a little just because of some things that you said um, about the music being a tool, a way for you to access your inner life. So later, I was going to ask you this much later, but now I want to know. <laughs> later, um, as you were navigating your mental health journey, which maybe you want to tell us a little bit about um, in what way, what I'm wondering is in, in what way did writing these songs help you and and was it a, a tool for healing? And also, were there limits to that? Like, were there limits to what what songwriting could do for you? That's so important to, to talk about. And, and I feel like when I listen back, um, the hardest chapter in my journey um, with bipolar disorder, which I didn't know I was managing for many years, uh, which I've now very, very gradually worked my way to being very open about, because uh, I think it's really important, especially for fellow artists, that we are really open about these issues. But um, the, the rock bottom came for me in 2006, and I was 28 years old. So when I look back at the songs that I was writing for probably 10 years before that, they were songs that were kind of mysterious to me. Like I was trying to chart this inner wilderness that I was experiencing, and I didn't, didn't have a map yet. So when I listened back, it was like I was wandering through a dark forest looking for clues about what was going on with me and looking for ways to hold on to the light and, and ways to ground myself. And, and then the songs after 2006, when I started treatment, real, you know, medical treatment and emotional treatment, I listened to the songs after 2006 and they're much more about healing rather than about exploring you know so i felt like the the great mystery was suddenly solved mm -hmm. even though i'm amazed that you know in ways i knew it all along in that decade but once it was really uh, there was a word for what i was experiencing and a a medical treatment for it then suddenly the music became less about the mystery and more about the healing and i mm. knew i'd been shadow boxing with something all those years and suddenly i knew what it was and then I could look right at it and say, now, now the healing starts. Mm. But the, some of the big things that I've found, there's a whole myth around madness and creativity. And I really try to shatter that myth whenever I yeah. talk about this because I don't think it's true. I don't think we have to suffer to be good artists. And that happens to have been my path, but I don't feel... Uh, that we should inflict more suffering. And I don't think we should avoid getting professional help for mental health issues uh, because I don't feel that music could have saved my life all on its own. It did yeah. a wonderful job of healing. It did a wonderful job of exploring. But if I hadn't gotten other help, music wasn't enough. And that's where we have to kind of navigate, I think, as artists, especially because creative people are so often wrestling with depression and mm -hmm. wrestling with other issues. And it's part of what makes us so in touch with that inner world. But we also, you know, I've, I've found in my life that I have to find a balance between my spiritual life, which has been really healing mm -hmm. and, and professional help and creativity. And I feel like you need all of them. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love what you're saying. I love that. Um, if I could just highlight it so that... <laughs> It really goes in. Um, well, I love that you use the word mapping because um, I often feel like writing songs or making an album is like a mapping of the soul or like an or or orienting for me, like for me where I am in my life or what I think or what I feel or what I've been through and how I process that. So I feel like 
saying mapping is really resonates. And I like how you uh, talk about how your early creativity and songwriting was exploring and then later it was healing. Um, oh, and there was something else that you said. Oh, just that, that the song, the music could not have healed you on your own. That's really important and are on its own. And also um, the spirituality piece um, and having that balance. So, yeah, so important. I feel like my music comes out of my, like the, 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 my spirituality and the music that I'm making are, are together, you know, they're not separate. And that one leads to the other, so. They're completely connected. And I've really thought about that now that I'm in divinity school some people think, oh my gosh, that's a really like huge departure from what you've been doing. And, and then other people like you get it immediately that it's just a continuation of what, what we're already doing as musicians. Like music is a form of chaplaincy. When we're on stage and we're singing to people, we're accompanying them on something very private and something very... Uh, very deep for them. So I don't, I don't find, you know, when I worked in the hospital all last summer, I didn't find a big difference. Aside from that, as a chaplain, you're not a performer. You're very much in the background. Yeah. But it's the same kind of skill of can you, can you be with someone in that space? Can you honor their inner world? You know, and as musicians, I think even when we're on stage and they're strangers, we still have that experience of something sacred is happening. Like when it's really working as a musician, you feel that. You feel that hush come over the yeah. room. You feel that there's a deeper connection happening. Yeah, and well, also for you, like if you're being with someone as a chaplain, one-on-one, -on -one, you're basically being with their story. And I've seen you and some of our other songwriting friends, um, and I know I have as well, you do that if you're writing someone's story, you're being with their story for maybe even longer for than at the bedside of someone in a hospital. And so you've had great practice for holding space for people's stories and their reality. Yeah, I ended up seeing it for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the story like yeah. works deeply into your being. Yeah. Um, Something I want to ask you, I feel like I've always wanted to ask you this, and I don't even know if I have asked you this, but for, for the songwriters who are listening and who may or may not know your music, um, I am wondering what a day in the life of Meg is like when you are writing, when you are writing songs or you're writing poetry. What I've noticed about you is that you the way I see it is that you prioritize living, you know, like you, you walk in the woods, you walk your dog, Austin, you, um, you're very alive. And, and I wondered if you feel like the songs are coming from your walks in the woods. And that is the thing that's like feeding your writing and, and bringing out the ideas. Um, I've also seen you be like a workhorse, you know, like when the label says, Meg, we need a record. In a, I think this is true, right? Meg, we need your record in a month or something and you, and you get to work and you finish it. And I was wondering if you could share, you know, some of how, how you think about that, do that in, in concrete, like daily ways. I've been really lucky because Red House Records actually never gave me one, a deadline or an ultimatum, which is good because I'm a slow worker. I mean, it's okay. been years between albums and they never say we need it by this time. Oh, okay. Um, okay. That, that kind of pressure has come from maybe other team members that I've worked with, um, but not, it's not come from the label, which is great because nice. I, once I have the songs, you know, once the whole family's there, then absolutely I buckle down and that's all I think about when it comes time to record once songs are captured, then I, then I go into that tunnel that you're describing and I am completely, that's all I'm thinking about <laughs> for months. And, it, and I have the blinders on because I know what I'm working with. But when I'm still looking for the songs, I can't push, I can't have a deadline, mm -hmm. um, which is just how I work. And, and I've always aspired to be the kind of songwriter that got up in the morning and wrote for two hours and then went about my day, but it's just never been how I work. Mm -hmm. and 
And what I've found instead that I feel like I'm much more like a photographer. And I feel like the, the couple hours I'm in the forest every day are the richest time for me. Mm -hmm. and I just try to bring like the mental camera with me. And whenever something is really striking me, I, I just take a, whether it's an internal experience I'm having or something I'm seeing around me, I just try to take that mental photograph. And, and I feel like what happens way later is that I'm actually developing the film. So I feel like I come home with this abundance and then I figure out, you know, kind of in the dark room, which for me is actually like, 3 a.m. <laughs> it's just a total night hell. So once, you know, I live in a very densely populated neighborhood. So once everything gets quiet uh, and everyone goes to sleep, like there's so much space. And, and that's when I feel like I go into the creative dark room. Or yeah. sometimes now I go into my closet that I've made into a little studio, you know, and I start recording and I just see what's going to come out of this. But that's, that's the way I work. I don't, I don't ever do very well just sitting down and saying, I'm going to write a song. But if I go out into the world and just bring that, that camera, bring that mental camera and just look for things that strike me, then I have all these rich images that I can, I've always felt like the metaphor has to start with the image, not with the idea of what I want to write a metaphor for. <laughs> oh, interesting. And then, you know, like I'll see uh, a tree growing around barbed wire and I'll just know that that's an image I want in a song like it so strikes me so deeply and then I come home and I say like what does that image mean to me instead of sitting at home thinking what's a metaphor for healing <laughs> you know oh. so it works kind of in the reverse but that's how I that's how I've found songwriting to work in my life that's so interesting so you'll go out and you'll you'll observe the the real world or I don't know if you ever are inspired walking in davis square or if it's always the woods but <laughs> you'll, you'll get this image and then you'll bring it home and then you'll you'll write about that if it struck you really deeply yeah that's always been how i work which is why I, you that's know when real. people invite me to co-write or be in a song group i mm -hmm. kind of panic because i don't know how to work that way you know I, I think it's a great skill to have but i if i'm sitting in a room at a scheduled time especially with someone i don't know and i'm told to write a song it's very challenging. Well, I something, you know what you're making me think of, something I love that you just said is that you said, what does this image mean to me? So you asked yourself a question. And I'm remembering when we did co-write a song, you and I and Ancha and Natalia for Winter Bloom, I feel like you were the instigator of the question. You would, I can't remember what questions you asked us, but you were like, why don't we answer the question, you know, <laughs> do you remember the question? But it was like a little bit of a prompt. The same I, think it's, I think it's the bridge section that we ended up using. Like, what's your greatest vision? Or was that your idea? We had a bunch no, of... No, I think words. what's your greatest vision might have been the question. And then we started kind of pouring out around that. Yeah, yeah. I think there... Yeah, questioning has been definitely, I think, one of the main tools for me of of working rather than knowing what I'm trying to accomplish. It's just been... I talk about it with Crit Harmon, who I, who's produced a bunch of records with me. That we talk about it as a fishing trip. You know, you just go out and you don't you don't quite know what you're what you're looking for yet. You know, and you just kind of allow yourself to be surprised and allow the world. A lot of it to me feels like developing the right sensitivity, the right ability to watch and observe, and that's the mm -hmm. skill set that matters to me the most. You know. Mm -hmm. I think as writers, like we, partly why we write is because we struggle with language. Like we struggle. We want to say things in the right way, and they don't come out in our lives in a graceful way. So then we go back to our room and we craft it. You know, I feel like that's the way. As an introvert and someone who feels kind of clumsy socially, you know, there's a way that I can kind of go back to my space and say it the way I really, yeah, say it. Oh, I love it. That's so great. Thank you, Meg. I can't believe I'm just learning this about you now. <laughs> I, feel, I feel similarly like I, like I walked in a field a few months ago near my house and all of a sudden this like melody and lyric came in. But I feel like I got it from the field. It's not like I, it was just sort of, and the other day I was singing by Lake, I think Lake Erie, or I, w I was just playing with my daughters by Lake Erie, but I started singing to the waves 
And it was something that I know it would never have come to me like sitting at home. It was just, and I think if I weren't like a songwriter, I would have forgotten it right after it happened. But as it went through me, I thought like, oh, and I, you know, I thought enough to like write it down. So do you ever get like melodies when you're walking in the woods or you just, you get the images and then? Only a few times has the music come at the same time. Like it's very rare. But what I love, like once I start, if I have a couple images, once I start looking around, I immediately record. You know, if I have, if I feel like I have a chorus and I have maybe the beginning of a verse, I immediately start, I hit voice memo on my phone and I, if I sit down with the guitar or the piano, I record the very first melodies that come out. And mm. that's been really important to me because it's before I start being too logical about it. If I just, start singing I mean it comes out really weird sometimes but that's I feel like I'll capture something in the first 15 minutes that then I can't access later so if I don't record it mm. it might get lost oh I love that I love that okay so just to highlight all of that going out into nature um, observing ordinary life like just being a witness of what's happening um, asking questions of the images that you find things that strike you and then lastly um recording the first melodies that come out before you can get into a critical headspace mm -hmm. did i say that right yeah. and we're lucky i mean technology in one sense is is problematic because it can cut like i've had to really limit myself on my hikes and just not be looking at my phone oh yeah but the bright side is if something does strike me in the forest and i do hear a melody i can just turn it on and sing it into my phone and that's really been a benefit of technology yeah i used to feel like if the song really wants to be born like before we had cell phones i'm like if the song really wants to be born it'll come back and bother me later um and now i, I guess i lost that faith because now <laughs> I, if something comes like i better get it that's i think it's a it. skill it's a muscle that we don't have just like handwriting you know like we lose the ability to do it i think when we don't practice it yeah we'll read a map we can't do that anymore uh, yeah i was thinking <laughs> of the map totally um okay so do you would you be willing to tell us a story of a certain song and and of how it came to be and and play it for us sure uh you, when we were talking, I was reminded of the one, the one song where a melody actually came to me while I was walking. It's the only song I've ever had that almost the entire thing was done before I finished my walk. And I remember running back to the car and all I had was a map in my car and I just wrote everything I could remember right onto the map before I got home. Oh, that's so um, but it was, it just started with images just walking in my favorite reservoir and I had just come through the worst depression of my life and it was that time where the beauty of the world was just coming back to me and if anyone listening has been through that depression you know what I mean if, if suddenly the color comes back to the world and suddenly the light comes back and and all your senses wake up again and it's so extraordinary that it's there have been times where I think it's almost worth the depression because when the beauty comes back, you can't take it for granted. You know, you've you've seen a world without it and you've seen a world where the sunset somehow doesn't reach you and and the moon rising doesn't fill you with wonder. So when that comes back, it's absolutely stunning. And that was the experience that the song came out of. It was just the most beautiful night at my favorite lake and I was out with my dog and it was dusk, and you know that there are little bugs here um, in New England. I don't know if they're everywhere, but but they just skim along the surface of the water, hundreds and hundreds, and they're just looking. For, I think they're looking for little littler bugs right on the surface. But the way that they work, it makes the whole surface of the water look like there's raindrops, and and that was the first image: bugs out on the water make it look like rain, and then the whole song just came. It was just really. And I had some, I think some, I had like a song sketch of something I'd been listening to that served as kind of a ryth rhythm template. So that was interesting that I, it somehow gave me the format for the verse structure. Just okay. to hear kind of a, a melody that had been stuck in my head and the, the melody that came out ended up being really different, but something about the, 
the cadence of it, the meter. I don't know that it helped me have like a little framework while I was walking and thinking of the song. But it was just this little gem. Like it was the only song that I haven't had to kind of work on more. It just kind of came out in a very simple way. But I think it was that just that overwhelming sense of wonder of the world coming back and mm. You know, the way when you're a traveler and the world is so vibrant when you're somewhere new. Yeah. That was what came back to me, even though I'd been walking in the same place for 10 years. Oh, wow. Like that, that seeing it for the first time, you know. And Will you play it for us? Sure. Thanks. I haven't been playing much this summer. I've been doing summer school, so <laughs> might be a little rusty. <laughs> See if I can find a way to do this. Um. You'll have to let me know if, if uh, the volume... Oh, there's my dog in the background. <laughs> Hi, Austin. <laughs> he really knows how to, how to snooze. <laughs> All right. You'll have to let me know if, um, if the guitar feels too loud compared to my voice. Feel free to stop me. I, th I think the guitar is, is good. It's a little below uh, your voice and volume, yeah. Good. I'll try to play it quietly. <clears throat> Bugs out on the water, make it look like rain Leaves on every tree, once again turning Summer's past, but it's never far If you look real close, you might see scars beneath Yeah, me, I'm only seeing stars Evening light on a gravel path I could be scared but I had enough of that old Big old moon rising up Even in this light you might see scars but me yeah, me, I'm only seeing the stars. And they take everything you got, nothing left of deer in the headlights. Your hospital bed just dreaming of a, a simple life. A gentleman, a solid night, me and the dog. Down at the reservoir, if you look real close, you might see scars beneath. Yeah, me, I'm only seeing the stars. Oh, 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 oh. Seems all your songs are about leaving Seems both your hands are about now Geese up in the sky, home through the dark If you look real close, you might see scars for me Yeah, me, I'm only seeing the stars me. Yeah, me, I'm only seeing the stars. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to play. <laughs> oh, so beautiful. Such a such a beautiful gem, and now I can. And now I'm picturing you walking while I hear it. Um, Meg, thanks so much for for talking and hanging out with me today. My um, pleasure. I, I I'd like to call you and interview you. <laughs> the same questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can. Um, is there anything that you would like to, thinking of songwriters who might be listening, any sort of advice or one thing you'd like to impart to them um, 
you know, creative souls, songwriters out there who feel like they have something to say, something that you feel like is, is most important to remember on their journey? The thing that I've always subscribed to is write what you know. And if it, you know, if it's fictional writing, embrace that. If it's writing about something really difficult in your own life or in yourself, write it. You know, I've always made that choice. And and maybe some people think, oh, you know, that's too personal what you're singing about. But ultimately, creativity has been a tool for me to transform my life. And the only way I was able to do that was through being honest about what I needed to write about. It didn't even feel like a choice a lot of the time. It just felt like this is what I need to get out and this is what I need to to process. So I think getting in touch with that as an artist, that's the part that resonates with other people. You know, I don't think you can sit down and say, I want to write a song that this kind of, you know, radio station would want to play or I don't think you can start with an idea of who your audience is and and how you want it to succeed. I think you have to start with, uh, I mean, that works. There are plenty of great songwriters in Nashville that know exactly who they're writing the song for and it comes out great. But for me, the journey has been about what do I need to, what's coming out of me? You know, what do I need to write? And then later I can, you know, it'll land wherever it needs to land. It'll find the friends that it wants to find. Uh, once the song's done, it 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 goes out and it it goes where it wants to go. But it's always started for me from the inside out, and so yeah. I think people should feel permission to just go wherever they need to go. You know, yeah. that's the act of creativity. I think. Yeah, tell the truth. Yeah, I love that. And be patient when you when you go through a period where you're not writing. You know, that's something you and I talked oh, about. Oh, yeah, we said we were going to talk about this. This was supposed to be yeah. the end, but I think, it's, <laughs> I think let's touch on that. I think it's really important. Yeah, I think just to have uh, patience and trust when you go through a time where you're not creative, where you're not, you know, I was, I was, we were talking about it before we started recording about how for me, you know, the creative spirit, it just feels like a river that's always been running through my life. And the water, the water doesn't stop flowing. It just goes into different channels. So right now it's going into school, but that's a whole different creative act. Um, right. but it's a similar process. So there are times where I just think, Oh my gosh, I'm just not, you know, I have not written a song in, <laughs> in quite a long time. But to have, instead of kind of bearing down on myself, to also say, you know, what does this look like? Are there different mediums where the same thing is happening? And to be open, you know, I wrote poetry instead recently, and and that worked. Or I spent months putting Robert Lowell poems to music, and that tapped me into to the creative energy of this great poet when I couldn't access my own. And, and that was also amazing, you know, just to step inside someone else's words and listen for the melody that they they already had. You know, poems, great poems already have a melody. They have music in them. So I think just to, you know, the thing I'm trying to teach myself right now is just to be open to how the creativity is not going away. I, I trust that. It's been with me my whole life. But that it ebbs and flows like any marriage, you know, it's going to take different outlets. It's going to go through different phases and to be open to that. And yeah. you know, see a lot of that in our friends, you know, whether it's deciding to focus on their painting or deciding, you know, there's mm-hmm. a, on their teaching or mm-hmm. it takes different, different outlets and to, to trust that not to bear down and say, I have to stick within what I used to do. Yeah. Trying to, to just kind of be open to, to what happens next, you know, whatever that looks like. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. I think it's so true. And, and I think that some of that is how we talk to ourselves inside our head. Like if you notice, oh, my creativity is going into school and there's a, there's a kind voice in your head about that. Like, oh, that, you know, that's different than if you're bearing down, like I should also be writing songs, even though I'm setting poetry. I feel like that's, um, I learned that over and over. Like I have songs, like I wrote a song for the Women's March, so it had like a definitive time that I started it and it needed to be done by. I have another song that I just finished that I started six years ago. And I thought that song was gone, 
you know, like, and I, um, but, I, but I'm just glad I didn't beat myself up about it. It just came back to me in a meditation one day and I thought, oh, I think this song like wants to have a life. So I, could, I just went back to it gently and I'm really glad that, you know, three years ago I didn't say like, fine, forget you, you know. <laughs> and and, and, and um, I know that some songwriters will come to me and say, I've been working on this, it's not working, I don't know. And then they'll hand me something that's really beautiful. Maybe it's not completely done. And uh, just being able to reframe what's happened, like, oh, this is wonderful. Maybe you just want to take a break and just talking to yourself in a, in a kind voice about that. And I, and I think just living, I, I always feel like living as an artist is as important as writing as an artist. You know, yeah. are you living every day with that openness, you know, and that, so just because you're not in the dark room developing the film, it doesn't mean you can't be out in your life, like taking photographs from, right. or years that can be used. Later. Right. You know, you can harvest from that. The creativity doesn't stop just because you're not producing something, you know? Totally. And, and just like asking yourself that question, like, what do I feel like doing creatively today? Maybe the answer is like going to a movie, like, oh, I want to go see Hidden Figures. Like, that's what lights me up. Maybe some day that will lead to a song. Maybe it won't, but, but, fo but following that impulse, I think, is ultimately like what you're saying, living as an artist. Absolutely. I love you, Meg. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> thanks so much for being here. And um, thanks, songwriters, for tuning in. And bye, Meg. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us. If you know someone who would enjoy or benefit from this podcast, please share it with them. Thanks so much. Much love.